Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. to each other, as I was thinking about that, uh, uh, what had come to mind for me was uh, uh, one of the great traditions among indigenous peoples around the globe is in fact saying your name, uh, declaring your name. So I would uh, ask that you offer your name in that same spirit, in the declaration of your name. It's not only about you. But when you say your name in a declarative sense, um, you are saying to the community, you're declaring your alignment um, with all that you are, all that you have come from, the fires of your ancestors from generations and centuries back. And so it's a declaration that right now you are the spark that is lit up from the embers and fires of your ancestors, your history, um, the generations uh, that have preceded you and also will follow. So as you declare your name, you can offer your first name, or your first and middle name, or your entire name. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, one word uh, with your name. It is the uh, season of winter. Um, it is a, a time in most cultures around, uh, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, for um, gestation, time for incubation, for going deep. It's a time for great silence, um, introspection, evaluation, and um, contemplation. So as you think of your life uh, today, in this season of winter, what word uh, comes up for you as you contemplate the, the disciplines and power of the season of winter? Let's have uh, 30 seconds of silence, and then I'll start the introductions, and we can go with you. My name is Howard Duncan Deport. Flowing. <coughs> Mark. Uh, Michael. Cass Brayton. David, space. Akosh, group. My name is Peter. Death. Mm -hmm. 
My name is James Seth Stewart, Jr. <laughs> Hi, Tech Hell. <laughs> Robert Joseph McMullen, acceptance. Peter Lloyd Washburn, son of Lloyd Jerome Washburn. And John William Busby, grandfather John, father William. I'm Andrea Schmitz, slowness and growing at my own pace. My name is Pablo Flamines, and I'm depressed. My name is Clinton Sider, grandson of Clinton Johnson. Lee Robbins, deepest darkness just before the dawn. David, David. kindness. <clears throat> My name is David Axel, Ben Mendel Axel, <laughs> laughter. My given name is Jerome Harday Jones III, and the last. And uh, mine is a courage. My name is Thomas Kern Bruin, the last of my name, last of my line, and uh, opportunity. James Barry and Richards. Uh, my name is Harley Paul Shapiro, and I'm tending the garden, preparing for a fruitful harvest. My name is Raymond Gordon Dyer. My name is <coughs> David Allen Margolis um, Nesson. <coughs> my, <name coughs> my name is Richard LaRose. Um, my father's name was Joseph Teofie LaRose. Uh, accepting. I'm George Woodman Hubbard son of George and Zella, um, compassion. My name is Don Lohren, and um, perseverance. My name is Tony Pasqua. My name is Michael, and transition. Stephen Ming Shan, wisdom. My name is Gary, it means warrior. I contemplate gentle. My name is Peter, stopping. My name is Alza, don't worry. <coughs> My name is Thomas Eads, snowy. Wow, that's a bow to each other. Um, here for the first time or returning after a long absence, if you can raise your hand. Well, for the first time, first time. Again, your name? Kevin. Kevin. Akosh. 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 Welcome. Joe. Joe. Price. Price. Yeah, and David, welcome back. It's great to see you. And Price, what was your worth? Mm. Amplexus. Uh, <laughs> mating frogs. <laughs> <laughs> frogs are mating this time of year. <laughs> and it's called Amplexus. How boring. That's what it's going to They also disappear. So we should talk afterwards. And <laughs> <laughs> Plexus. Mm. Well, one of the, one of the um, principles that guides my life, uh, especially as speaker coordinator, is no force, just flow. So uh, our speaker is scheduled for today, none of which are here. <laughs> And in the process, um, what 
God is manifest in our presence is the right person um, in the right place at the right time. And my work, uh, Thomas, was just to let it go and trust um, uh, that you would be here uh, this day. So it is uh, my privilege to welcome uh, Thomas uh, Eads. 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 Mm -hmm. B-A-D, isn't David? Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thomas, welcome. Thomas is a friend and colleague of Dennis Manuelito, who's a member and active participant here in the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. <coughs> and so we contemplated reflections for this day, themes for this day, the idea of uh, two-spirit consciousness um, and, and um, its manifestation in the world today would be a, a wonderful um, Dharma reflection. And uh, so, uh, Thomas, we're, we're just uh, delighted to have you here this day, and we uh, give you our undivided uh, attention. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, I like the name introduction in um, I'm Ho Chunk, um, which is uh, English Wisconsin Winnebago. My tribe is from Wisconsin, and uh, my my Ho Chunk name is Ahu Pink Unga, and it's uh, Eagle Fixing His Wings, and um, it comes. I'm my family is my mom's people are Thunderbird Clan. So all the names have sky, we're, we're sky people. And there's uh, other clans, wolf clan, they're, they're earth people and they would have earth names and stuff. But mine is um, eagle fixing his wings. So it's like when a bird lands and they're doing that, getting their feathers all fixed back, that's, <coughs> that's what my name is. And um, it's very, very important to me to have that and to have that connection. And um, I think I'm pretty fortunate that my family um, has maintained a lot of the traditions and cultures and history and stuff, so I have that. Being here in the city, there are a lot of um, relocated um, Native Americans where they're, it's lost. Um, Dennis Benuelito and I know each other from, from work in the Native American community around um, health issues and HIV issues, and my personal experience is uh, is um, becoming more involved when the the AIDS epidemic hit, and like most communities, it, it brought us together really, really fast and really quickly. Um, I'm not an expert or historian or anything. The other gentleman who was supposed to be here is the one of the community historians, so. Um, He's not here, so I just share my personal experience. I'm a 12-stepper, so it's about experience, strength, and hope, kind of my living philosophy thing. And um, and uh, one of the things from 12-step was um, it's about the journey and not having the answers, but being open to, to new things and stuff. So that's probably why I'm here as well. One of the premises, too, is um, service. So when a community member asks for service or something, then there's a reason why I'm supposed to do that. So I just do that. Um, I think the Native American two-spirit philosophy, belief kind of culture is a very contemporary culture. It's something that uh, we're reclaiming. Two-spirit terminology is a very probably like early 90s, there was a big movement and a lot of people were coming together, especially in the Bay Area and Chicago, Minneapolis. The groups were, were really forming and getting together and talking and they wanted to kind of uh, have identity that was, that was very relevant for them. And so it's not, to me, it's not a historical, tribal, indigenous, Word, it's it's something that's contemporary that was made to, for where we are right now. And basically, what it does is acknowledge our male and female components, and we all have male and female components, and and um, we're just more 
in tune with it, I guess, to have that not be so gender directed. Um, I think a lot of people are going back personally, like for me, going back and talking with my family and the community members about what was our traditional way of of dealing with gay people and lesbian people, bisexual people, transgender people. I talk to my mom about it a lot and um, my aunts and uncles and stuff, and they're pretty open about it. And one of the things that I talk to them about, ask them about, because if something is new, if a concept is new, then in Ho-Chunk language, then there would be the English version of it. But in Ho-Chunk, there are all these different variations on a, a person. So there's a gay person, there's a transgender person, there's a hermaphrodite person, and there's Ho-Chunk words for all those things. So um, I talked to the elders about it, and I'm like, you know, we have, if it's something that's always been part of our culture and part of our past and stuff like that, then it, then we have our own words for it. And we have words for all these these different peoples. So they've always been around forever and ever. And they're like, yeah. My mom's like, yeah, I don't get the whole gays in the military thing. There's always been gays in the military. <laughs> There's always been gay people. So um, she's like, I don't know why people get all worked up over stuff. And why does everybody have to be in everybody's business now about all that stuff? And, and um, going back, because there are many populations where homophobia is really, really strong. And part of that is the historical contact with the Europeans and the Christianity and and the uh, um, <clears throat> tribal people got very, they didn't want to offend the, the white people so they were like, oh, okay, we can't be, they get very offended by our lifestyles and stuff so they started um, hiding it and, and stuffing it down and stuff. So there's a reclaiming of a lot of the history and culture. And there's still a lot of work because um, Christianity has gotten so embedded in many of the communities, and there's still a lot of um, a lot of uh, homophobia that is even more so some communities than what you would expect in the general population. Just it's like overkill, like way literally overkill. Um, Native transgender people are, are being killed today because of homophobia, because they're in rural places, reservations, and very, very um, backwards thinking people and stuff. So um, my experience was coming to the Bay Area and working with the American Indian AIDS Institute and um, just meeting all the different kinds of people. There's not one. I mean, there's, I don't know how many hundreds of different cultures and Everybody does their own thing and has different perspectives on it. But one of the consistent things is when those of us, and, and I think our generation part of it is our responsibility to go back and find that history and maintain that and keep it going. And um, I really feel fortunate that my tribe was very much, the people were very stubborn. Um, my tribe is from Wisconsin. The reservation for my tribe is in Nebraska. And so there are two. There's Nebraska Winnebago and there's Wisconsin Winnebago. And they put the people, the um, government took the Wisconsin people, put them in Nebraska and said, here's your reservation. And um, when they got there, Wisconsin's very timber, forest, heavy, dense woodland. And Nebraska's kind of flat and not really a lot of trees or anything. <laughs> and they were like, no, this is totally, we, have, we don't know what to do here. This is horrible. And, and they walked back. And then the government said, oh, they came back. And they sent them back again. So they did it four times. Four times they moved the people. And, they, and my answers went back. So um, today I'm like, I, stubbornness, <laughs> thing, it totally is just genetic. It's, it's, you know, these people walked across states to get back home months and months, and, and people died and people lost their way and stuff along the way. But they came back. So Wisconsin, there's these areas there. So it's a very, um, they, they maintain their culture and their land and 
they're always telling me to come home. They're like, you know, we pray for you. We send you all this medicine, and it has to travel all that way. You would get more if you were closer here. You're the only one who went away, and everybody else is right here in a, in a couple mile radius. My family members are all right there. Their house, my nieces and nephews, all run around each other's houses and stuff. And in this country, and you know, there's animals, and it's very, very. When I do go home, it's very, I'm home. It's, I go out in the back meadow and lay down and look up at the start, and the whole field, the whole thing is covered in fireflies at dusk. They come out, and there's just this whole twinkling all over the, the mist on the meadow. And, and it is. It's very, very spiritual there. <clears throat> and you can tell there's a lot of um, history there and stuff, and... So part of it is for us to go back and, and keep those those um, pieces of, of information alive and keep keep working on it and and bringing it up so we can counteract the the Christian Christian influences that have become so hard to deal with uh, for a lot of the people. Um, part of the the American Indian Ace Institute philosophy was was nurturing and caring for people who were sick and dying. And, and um, the, the medicine that came was very, very powerful for me. And um, it was in conjunction with the Western medicine, but um, it gave people a lot of comfort. And a lot of people who were supposed to be um, not here very long, you know, stayed a lot, lot longer, I think, because of the, the medicine that was at the... Um, at the center. Um, I really don't know. Like the history and stuff, that's the other people that got all the facts and who was where, when, when all the, the dialogue started around stuff. But for me, it's just a personal journey. And I think that um, with the people that I meet, we're a really small community. And so we kind of all know each other. And that's how I ended up here today. And, and we just try to um, support each other and encourage each other in telling our own histories. And um, there's a gathering called the Two-Spirit Gathering that's held up by Minnesota, Canada, up in that area there. They usually do it. I'm a total urban Indian, so I don't do the camping thing. <laughs> I'm really there. I understand it all. I get it. I can come for the day, but I don't do the no bathroom, no roughing it. Is, there's no TV. If there's no TV. That's pretty rough for me. Um, but you know, this being in the center and being on the floor, this is totally cool because this is how my family and the community they do all the traditional feasts and ceremonies and things. It's always done sitting on the ground and and no chairs and stuff like that. So this is totally cool. Very reminiscent of that. I think probably what I'd like to do is just open it up for questions to see if anybody had dialogue to go on because um, I kind of feel we're just talking up front and so it's kind of more if it was open, opened up and we could share perspectives. I got a couple questions. One is... Um, does the, the acceptance or intolerance towards gays and lesbians and the American tribe to tribe? Mm -hmm. um, and why is that? Just because well, some tribes that have less of a, of a you know, influence on Christian religion than mm -hmm. others. And, and, and also, you mentioned there's a word for transgender. I, I, was, I always consider transgender kind of a modern, a reasonably modern medical procedure. So I wonder what was transgender, what did transgender mean, you know, for your tribe in the early mm -hmm. days? Yeah, I think the transgender part was hermaphrodite, I think, because there's different, they're, they're like I'm a Shange, Shange is a homosexual, but then there's other words for, <clears throat> for different roles, and then it's not, it's not static, like each community, like it's not, because today we always talk about homosexuality and gay or, or straight, or, but it's, it was more about like your role in the community and your fitting in and stuff like that. So it was, it was um, 
like very fluid, like the spectrum, the gender identification. It was all these different parts. So it was like, oh, this person is homosexual in that he likes to sleep with men, but there's somebody who wants to be dressed up like a woman, and same thing for the women who are more hunters and stuff. And so it was like, what when they were growing up, a kid would be identified like, how did they naturally? Do they want to play with the women in the kitchen, or do they want to go hang out with the guys killing the deer? Or and so it's kind of you would let them. They didn't pigeonhole people and say, okay, that person isn't going where most of us, but that's how they want to be. And they would let them go. So, and it would be all over the spectrum. So I think Western, contemporary, we're very this way, that way. And it was more, that's how that person wants to be and kind of more open. And then the influences are all over the place because some people had very, there's Catholic influence, there's Baptist influence, there's... Yeah, and there's, it's all like how my mom, I'm first generation public school. My mom went to Indian boarding school. And that's where up until her generation, all the Indian kids got took from the families and had to go to boarding schools and they were raised to be white people. So she was taught not to, she would be locked in the closet. They would beat her if she had something tribal, anything, jewelry, clothing, if she spoke her language because it was all about getting her to be a housekeeper or a maid, and then the boys were taught how to be farmers and, and, and industrial workers and stuff. So, so it was beat out of them a lot. And that, that depended by school. Like some schools would probably not be as hard-handed, and some were way worse. So it depended on who was running that school <coughs> at the time or, and the church influence. And, some of the church leaders, they were more about um, equality and just bringing the word of God, and they didn't want to destroy all the culture, but the majority of them were about, in order to get God, we have to destroy your culture. So, It's moving and painful for me to hear your story in a way, because I grew up in Wisconsin, my uh-huh. father's a farmer. Mm-hmm. I grew up maybe 18 miles away from Lake Winnebago. Oh. And all the names of all the towns and the places have Native American and Indian names. Mm-hmm. But there was nobody there. And so there's a kind of break in one's, in my experience. Because there I had enormous contact with the land. Mm-hmm. But this land had been used and integrated into a culture before my own. And there was nothing. I mean, I could read about it in the book. There was no living connection. So to actually hear, you know, a little bit of your history <coughs> is kind of a both a very painful and a very connecting kind of mm-hmm. history. Because there's a lot of pain. Because the people who lived in this area did not leave because they chose to, you know, there's all of that. But there was no way to connect or to heal that in that. In a way, I had more connection here in the Bay Area because there's been more mm-hmm. availability. So I appreciate it enormously. Yeah, no, Wisconsin has a very vibrant, all the tribes. There's 12 main tribes there. and My family, the people there, what they did was there wasn't, because we kept coming back, they didn't um, make one reservation <coughs> to a little pocket, so it's, the primary bulk of the, my family is um, Toma, Black River, mm-hmm. um, La Crosse. There's big communities there. And then Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin Rapids, Nina. There's little pockets all around there. Yeah, so it's, I mean, they totally, they have a lot going on there. And, and I miss it a lot. And, and it's totally different out here. Um, the southwestern Mexican influence, it's, it's different cultures and stuff like that. And, but yeah, I um, am a teacher. I worked for a long time in HIV AIDS and now I went back and got my teaching certificate because working in human service, one of the things I saw was working with adults, 40s and 50s and stuff, you were only going to get make a little difference in, in getting somebody healthy. And I was seeing more of needing to work with 
getting people younger and giving them the skills they need and stuff to stay in school and, and be able to take care of themselves later in life and stuff. And, and um, the school in Wisconsin is uh, very specific. There's a Indian community school there. So it's totally, there's over 100 tribes and it's um, K through eight and um, 300 and some Native American students. And the whole curriculum is around indigenous philosophy, history, stuff like that, and incorporated with the, the state standards. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. I echo your uh, comment regarding that um, the culture embraces a spectrum and not sort of a pigeonhole role for everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, another example is ancient China. There's this breed of servants called the Inats, and they are all gays. But yeah, and, and they, they actually serve a purpose because they, uh, they pose no threat to uh, sort of sexual predator, sort of, uh, predator of the empress. So they are a class of um, servants that is uh, handpicked to actually serve the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, emp uh, the, the empress. Yeah. So that, that's another example of, of so that's, uh, the culture and basis of spectrum. Mm -hmm. Roles and not pigeonhole that you got to be out there or you got to be a kitchen mm -hmm. cooker. I like that. <coughs> yeah, you, you said you were the first generation to go to public school. I, I'm wondering what it was like for you, um, you know, realizing as an adolescent that you had gay feelings or leanings. Were you with other Native Americans at all, or were you in a totally white uh, school? Or what was it like for you as a, as a young gay person? Um, I'm a Navy brat because my dad is Welsh. My mom is um, Native American. So we were going back because he was in the Navy. So we were San I was born in San Diego. So we were going back and forth all the time well, until he retired. Then we moved permanently back to Wisconsin. So a lot of my early years, I think, to my, to my fortune was um, going to public school in San Diego and San Diego um, in the 60s and 70s was very um, similar to San Francisco, very diverse, very hippie, very, you know, all different kinds of perspectives were in the school and stuff. So um, my early education was, was good. And then middle school, high school, we went back to Wisconsin and oh my God. <laughs> It was like rural Wisconsin coming from San Diego. It was San Diego when I left. My music was Ohio Players, BT Express, um, very, very urban music. And um, went back to Wisconsin and went to Toma. And it was Fleetwood Mac and Ario Speedwagon and Styx. And so, um, and there were no people of color at all. Uh, very, very farmer. Um, kids getting on the school bus and kicking manure off their shoes because they've been up since 3.30 doing farm work before school. And it was like, wow, culture shock. Um, so my, my coming out gay was, was in rural Wisconsin. And that wasn't really so great. But I think um, really when I... Um, it was about 15, I guess, 14, 15. I, I, in school, people talked about this gay bar that was in La Crosse, which was about 60 minutes away, 60 miles away, the big town. That was the, the biggest town. <laughs> and there was a gay bar there called Mothers. So, of course, as soon as I could, I like took off and hitchhiked and went to La Crosse and, and went to this bar and, and saw the other gay people and... Um, of course, being underage guy in the bar got picked up really fast. And, <laughs> uh, hanging out in the alley, there were a bunch of us teenagers who were all hanging out and trying to get in the gay bar. And, and you didn't have to go in the gay bar because you could just be in the alley and get picked up by the older people and get drunk and high and everything. And, and um, But through that network, there's a group of people that I'm still friends with today who... There, we're still alive and we've made it through the apocalypse and, and um, we talk a lot because we were in rural Wisconsin and this group of people young gay guys got together 
and there were a couple older guys who weren't about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and and were more mentoring. And a lot of I think our our ability to defend ourselves and take care of ourselves and live our lives um, came from those older people, who in the middle of rural Wisconsin were living totally gay lives and. Some of the most fabulous parties I ever was at were in Sparta, Wisconsin, population 5,000. And the little old ladies were peeking over the back fence and calling the police because the faggots were dancing and singing and wearing pink caftans. And, and, uh, and it was just how it was. And you just didn't mess with us. And we would fight you and stuff. And, and, um, and yeah, so I think a lot of it, a lot of our strength and stuff comes from that, that adversity, that living, you know, it was like the AIDS later, you, you get tighter, you get more strength when, when, the, when the pain comes to do with the pain. Thomas? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, is there... To your knowledge, is there a role that the Two-Spirit um, community plays with the larger Native community in North America? Um, is, is that role being reclaimed, and if so, how is it playing out? Where, where is the Native communities in North America gaining their, their hope or their spirit Mm -hmm. sense of purpose I think that with our gen this generation there's been a huge um, visibility and we have become more open and we're willing to stand up in our own communities and raise these issues and have these discussions my personal experience is um, I've had nothing but positive experience when i when I crack open the, the subject. And I think a lot of it is people are um, more quiet about things and don't necessarily want to be the one to bring it up. But there's more of us who are willing to bring these issues up. And the, our response in the community is a lot, for, for me, it's more, more good than bad, is that people are like, yeah, the, we are looking at the older ways because part of it is I I will in general Indian community meetings um, we talk about who gets to define tradition because they say oh traditionally we did this traditionally and it's like who gets to pick and choose what traditions you know traditionally we didn't drive a car but we drive a car today why so what which ones do you want to pick well traditionally we didn't acknowledge the gay people. Mm. I think what there was, you know, so we have to have those discussions about who is being influenced and setting the traditions. I think that's one of the things with Christianity, there's a lot of traditionally we did this, traditionally, and it's like, well, who's deciding what traditions? I think a lot of traditions get left and misinterpreted or reinterpreted, so we have those talk. I think a lot of it's just being more visible and part of just general, um, Movements, gay lesbian history, gay lesbian movements. It's, it's not. There wasn't a '70s gay rights movement. It's since the beginning of time. These, these are ebbs and flows. So we, we push, push back, push, push back, and it's just evolution. And you know, there's times when it's been really hard, and there's times when it's been more open, and and it just evolves and keeps going. So, I think. Um, that we just have to be willing to talk about it and raise the issues and um, say, you know, our, our voice is just as relevant and important as the so-called elders and stuff like that. And just being aware of people's perspectives. There are some people in the community here. Um, we're totally involved. It's like, all the community service programs and stuff like that, there's gays and lesbians and bisexuals and transgenders all over, all over. And we're, we're much more about being ourselves. And I go into the schools and I'm a teacher and I do, I'm just me and I don't hide anything and I get no flack. 
you know, part of it is it's San Francisco and I'm Union and they can't say <laughs> <laughs> But part of it is just being who I am and not being ashamed and being open about it. It takes away that, that power they have to make me feel bad. And they can't, it's like, oh, oh, he's not hiding anything. It's just he's an open book, so we don't have anything to pick on. We can't. We can't tell his secret to anybody because he's already told it. And um, they just got to get to see us as who we are. But there's still homophobia. There's still very heavy Catholic um, influence and Christian influence um, that for some of the old timers who, who they have a hard time with it. Um, in terms of that Christian influence, has there been has it been waning quite a bit? I mean, as people, it seems to me, as people look into these to the traditions more, they mm-hmm. I imagine there's some kind of enlightenment going on. Like this, this religion was really brought in mostly for social control and not mm-hmm. not to bring. I mean, not completely in, in some respects, but is there is there kind of an awareness and a reevaluation of Christianity? Maybe not total rejection, but is that gaining momentum mm-hmm. across the board? Yeah, I think so. I think there's more overall returning to the traditional beliefs. And um, luckily for me, my family has um, maintained uh, the traditional religion, spirituality of the tribe. So a lot of that is um, is very, very clear for me on how that stuff works. But I think a lot more people are, are um, going back and... And it's kind of kind of pan Indian. There's a Native American church, and that's it's Native American church blends um, peyote with Christianity, so they go together, and um, and uh, it's a hybrid. There's a lot a lot of hybrid things that are going on, but there's more and more traditional practices that are being incorporated into that, and. And it's not so, so punitive, I guess, to be to go to the Christian. The Christians are being more open and not so directorial about this is our way, and they're kind of seeing that, that influence. Are you finding that the, the actually the Christians, the Catholics, and the other Christian groups are starting to listen to the Native communities mm-hmm. and actually change mm-hmm. themselves? Yeah. yeah, incorporating more more traditional. How how is it more? Your traditional idea and the Christian idea, where do they cross? And how can they coexist and be more there as opposed to Jesus or your gods? Mm-hmm. It's not either or. It's kind of where did these ideas and philosophies and things go together? And just the people are more about reclaiming their, their own stuff. Maybe just like, you know, that was something imported, brought in, pushed on us. And my mom's totally, because she went to the Indian boarding school, and she's just, I was like, Mom, for as much as you hate white people, why did you marry one? <laughs> <laughs> and I got slapped across the face. And was like, That's different. He lived here with us. He came here with us. He hated the white people, too. <laughs> And um, and he is. He's one of the. There's two white people that are buried in the Indian cemetery, and he's one of them. And he had an Indian burial, and it was in the Indian community. And because he just spent, I don't know, he had some falling out with his people. Because because we tried to ask more about that side of the family to understand that. Because because history is, is both sides for me. It's finding out as much as I can about that makes me. And um, I don't know. He had something. His his father was a racist and. And he had a falling out with that side of the family and didn't have too much about that. Um, you bring up a good point. And I'm, I'm curious about how culturally does your tribe, your clan, deal with um, residual animosity and how can that be bridged? You know, when you look at what was taken away, what was stolen, what was, you know, uh, the transgressions that were um, levied upon. I think for me, part of my teaching and, and being an educator 
and working with young people is just acknowledging what happened and acknowledging our presence. I think one of the things I run into being in the Bay Area and a teacher and going into the schools there, my, from not, not from the kids, from my colleagues, is are there Native Americans in the Bay Area? Are there Native Americans in the school system? And I think there's a um, discrimination by omission. And it's not that we're invisible, but people choose not to see us. So we're like ghosts that wander around and we're amongst you all and everything. And But I don't want to, I don't want, that hurts me to talk about what my ancestors did to somebody. So I don't want to bring it up and like, let's not talk about it and let's just um, move on. So for me in education, what I do is, is just bring it up and talk about it, and this is what happened. And it's not about guilt. Guilt is a wasted emotion. It's, it's, not, it's just acknowledging what is and what was and where we can go. And, and to not, history repeats itself if we don't know our history and you know how do we learn from it. So for me, a lot of it is just bringing that, getting that education in, and being in the school district, there are no Native American history books. There's no Native American culture. You know, we've got African American, we got Latino, we have Asian, we have European, and no Native American. It's like, why is that? We don't start that until fourth grade. Fourth grade, there's a Native American unit that starts, and middle school, high school, you get more. But this whole gap, and um, it's like, um, it's the just telling the that there were people here, there were human beings here before, and and they got put aside for these things and killed and destroyed and all that stuff. So a lot of it is just telling the the truth and the reasons why it's it's power and land and all that stuff that you know people have to make restitution for. That's why these things don't get talked about. It's like, oh, we don't want to acknowledge that because something that happened 300 years ago isn't applicable to me, you know, and I shouldn't have to be giving anything back. But, but yeah, so it's just telling the truth. I, uh, Friday I was at, I had three classes, and just letting them know, just like, you know, put yourself in these people's situation. Think of your home right now. Think of your family. Think of the environment that you live in, your school. And some outsiders came and put you all on a train and took you away. And just think about that. So just to give them that kind of story and perspective and stuff lets them know the history and stuff. But I think we, we in America, there is so much we want to um, be... It's like if you read the Declaration of Independence... It's like, where does it talk about Native Americans in the Declaration of Independence? It does. And it's used as one of the reasons why the country was declaring its independence, because King George was siding with the merciless savages who killed indiscriminately men, women, and children. And it's, it says that in the Declaration of Independence. So it's like, mm. So we want the Native people to like love this declaration. It's, You're calling us merciless savages, and we killed everybody. So... Um, those kind of history things, you know, there's different parts. It's like, you know, who was, who was the only president to deny a Supreme Court ruling? And it was when the Cher Georgia Supreme Court said, no, you can't take this land from the Cherokees. And the president said, enforce your judgment. And they took the land and put the Cherokees on the in Oklahoma. So, and those kind of things like that, just, we don't talk about that. Jackson, 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 Jackson. Jackson, yeah. Yeah, and, and we're taught to revere these people, and it's like, he hated us. That person hated us. They're about expansionist and getting rid of the people's rights. So I think it's more just telling that, learning more of the history. And then the teachers, a lot of it is I put on them because they're like, oh, can you come and do that? And that's my thing is I'm a teacher I learned a lot of this from you know studying and stuff like that too to get these facts right so it shouldn't just be on me to have to educate your kids you should be doing this yourself you should have this information already it's like I I know a lot of your history why don't you know more about my history 
So that kind of stuff just. Mm -hmm. We're running real short. One, one quick question. Um, is there something in the um, native two spirit uh, communities that you don't see in mainstream gay culture that uh, is something? It's kind of an open ended question, but comparing the two, you know, um, like walking between the worlds, is there something there that, that we can learn from? It's, I think it's kind of, we're similar. I think it's just, you know, we're creating these new contemporary identities and we're learning about our past and, and the real truth about our past. So I think that's not so much the differences about it. And the two spirits saying it's all over the place. I mean, there's so many tribes and so many people interpreting how their tribe did it and, and their roles in the community and stuff. I think one of the things I notice is that when we come out our community accepts us faster and we're incorporated into the community quicker and because we, we crack that subject open and they're like, oh yeah, we kind of, and we're being kind of mean about it, where we in. And um, yeah, because I mean today it's like, you know, I broke up with a boyfriend and he went and visited my mom and she calls me up and she's like, you guys, you young people today, oh, everything's a honeymoon. <laughs> you got to work through shit. You think every day I loved your father and we got along? No, you got to work through shit. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not having this kind of thing about that. Because you don't even know what he did. Okay? I won't even tell you. But uh, just to be able to have the, I'm like, oh, my God. And then he um, totally liked he loved my family. He still he loves my family, and he's still part of part of that circle. Um, but he goes on his own to visit my family, and I'm like, dude, this is my family. You guys are like, like, what are you doing? Like, my mom called him. She's like, oh, Wade came by, and we went out for pizza. And um, your brother took him to the vol. The kids were having volleyball, and they all went for volleyball and went for pizza. And I'm like, dude, why are you going by my family? It's not like it's next door. I mean, it's like hours away. <laughs> And he's like, Thomas Lee, your family loves me, and they don't care anything about the gay thing. And he goes, my family hates me, and they don't um, acknowledge him or anything. The whole gay thing, just I mean, this person is cut off. So I think, I think one thing about the Indian communities is, you know, no matter what, no matter how where they think you might have gone off track or whatever, your community and your family and the doors are always open, even if they don't agree with you. And they take you in and, and at least tolerate you. But I think for for like uh, my ex to have some, I don't get it. It's like you would cut this person out, you would deny this person, and not invite them to family things. And mm -hmm. it's just that I think that that's part of the <coughs> distancing thing in relationships. I think I think Indian community. It's like in in our language, they don't. We don't have words for cousins. It's like my nieces or my um, cousins are my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Like there isn't a, a ho chunk word for that. It's <coughs> your brother. And then same thing with your. We don't have words for aunts and uncles. It's big mama if they're older than my mom, and little mama if they're younger than my mom, and big dad and little dad on the uncle side. And so that it's relationships are really close and tight. Well, Thomas, so your um, your calling to service has been a rich blessing to us this day. Would you uh, share with us one more time your uh, Hugungwe? What is your, your native name? The name yeah. is Ahu Pink Unga. Ahu Pink Unga. Mm -hmm. We bow. Okay. And uh, uh, if you can uh, hang around during our tea time, I'm sure uh, many of us would like to talk with you more. Mm -hmm. So, time now for our announcements. And we do have a host today. Yes. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm your host today. Um, so there are some refreshments, goodies outside. First, to ask if you 
of tea that you please wash your teacup with hot soapy water and put it in a drying rack. That would be great help. There's a uh, sign-up sheet near the Donna Bowl uh, <coughs> if you want to get on the mailing list to receive the newsletter. Please add your name and address. And I think their roster is there. If, there's, if your name and address is incorrect on the roster, you can notate that and I guess tell Ray. Um, after the goodies at around 12.30, some people will gather by the front door to go out to lunch. If you would like to do that, it's all very impromptu. You're welcome to join that. And finally, in addition to giving you an opportunity to practice together and these wonderful Dharma talks, we also give you the opportunity to practice generosity. So I'll be coming around with the Dharma Bowl and uh, we suggest a donation of five to eight dollars from everyone. And thank you for that. Other announcements? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Next. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, April 18th. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have an all-day uh, silent meditation retreat here. Yeah. So um, put it on your calendar. Um, and there will be at least one uh, discussion element of that. And um, I think we're going to have some delicious food um, prepared. And um, so it's Saturday, April 18th. Our speaker next week will be uh, Richard Shankman. And uh, look, forward, look forward to his uh, Dharma talk. Any other announcements? Thomas, do you, do you, uh, this is just like off the cuff, but do you have a blessing that uh, you think you can share with us if we allow you that? <laughs> <laughs> if not, I have stuff here. Okay, you could do that. What do my stuff? Okay, we can stand and take one of those. Stuff. <laughs> power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion. And live believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.